All right, let's try this again. Uh, let's see. There we go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. How is everybody doing today? My name is Miss Julie, and I am here at the Charlestown Library for our Monday morning story time. I had a little technical difficulty there in the beginning. I uh, had it all set up, hit the go live button, and it just went away. Didn't, wasn't cooperating, so I had to start all over. But we are here now. So if you uh, pop on, say hello when you come into the live so that I know you're here. Um, I believe I am on the right page. Yes, I am. So that's good. Um, and we are going to be talking about President's Day today. So uh, some people don't have to work today. I know the schools are um, releasing kids a couple of hours early. And so uh, we just have some fun stories that we're going to be reading about President's Day. Um, and I've got some fun facts and some trivia and some um, jokes for you. So let me know uh, if you're here when you pop on and um, yeah we will go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and sing our opening song. Uh, if you know the words, then um, join me in singing them. <laughs> hello, hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, let me just let people know I was um, a little late today. So there we go. Okay, hello, hello, friends. If you're here, just let me know, leave a comment. Uh, I do have my story time chime that I will read when you come into the live. Four score and seven minutes ago, people were eating waffles. I think maybe you were eating waffles. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Lauren. Happy story time. Good morning, ladies. Happy story time. Hello, Sarah. How are you? Here's your story time chime. All right. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and sing our opening song. If you know the words, join me and uh, we will we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So here we go. Ready? Come with me, come with me, it's story time, it's story time. I have a tale to tell, come sit with me a spell. It's so fun, it's so fun. Great job, everybody! I am so happy that you are here today. Like I said, we have stories about President's Day or president themed kind of um yeah so yes happy monday happy monday it's supposed to get really warm today up into the 60s this afternoon so that's crazy but all right well we're gonna go ahead and get started and i'm going to start with this book isabella girl in charge and we do have some um you know, presidential features here. Um, I, in my, when I was setting up the other video, the one that kind of crashed when I hit go live, um, I had a piece, I had a bit of trivia in the description box and we're going to go through some of it uh, as we go on through our story time. But did you know that the White House was not always called the White House? I did not know this. Um, and sometimes it was called the executive mansion. Um, sometimes it was called the, uh, the president's house. Um, and I think it was Theodore Roosevelt who officially named it the white house. Um, oh wait, no, it, 
Yeah, it was Theodore Roosevelt who initially named it, or who officially <laughs> named it the White House. So, all right, Isabella Girl in Charge. We are going to get started. Hello, hello. If you're joining, please sell, say hello in the comments. Um, okay, here we go. Isabella Girl in Charge. I'm going to turn this a little bit more. Here we go. All right. I'm ready, said the little girl. Let's go. It's not time, Isabella, the mother said. It's not even daylight. My name is not Isabella, said the little girl. Here you can see on the clock it says 6 a.m. That's, that's early. <laughs> she says, I am Susanna, mayor of this here town. And the mother says, well, Susanna, a little more sleep, please. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. So Susanna was Susanna Salter, who was the first female mayor of a town. I'm ready, said the little girl. Let's go. It's not time, Susanna, the mother said. Breakfast first. My name is not Susanna, said the little girl. I'm Jeanette, and I'll represent you. Well, Jeanette, even when we're not in our house, we still eat a good breakfast. Look at all those. What are those, mice? Those look like mice. And Jeanette was um, Jeanette Ross, who was the first uh, female governor. Is that right? It's in the back of the book here. Oh, no, Jeanette Rankin, first woman elected to Congress. Sorry. Let me make sure. I feel like I skipped. No, I didn't. <laughs> First woman elected to Congress. Okay. Let's vote on breakfast. I want donuts, said the little girl. Your father and I vote oatmeal. That's two to one for a healthy breakfast. That's not fair, said the little girl. We each get one vote. That's fair, Jeanette, said the father. My name is not Jeanette, said the little girl. She has a holding up a sign that says donuts for breakfast. I agree with her. I would I would love to have donuts for breakfast. I love donuts. Love them. <laughs> All right. I am Nelly and I prohibit you from going without me. Of course not, Nelly. Care for a mint? And that's Nelly Ross and she is the first female governor. I'm ready, said the little girl. Let's go. It's not time, Nellie, the mother said. My name is not Nellie, said the little girl. Hello, hello. Let me know you're here in the comments. Say hi. I am Francis, New Deal. Let's go. Well, Francis, we need to check out first. Please pack your things from the cabinet. I will help with that at a minimum. And this is Frances Perkins, who is the first uh, female cabinet member. And they're all like wearing little sashes that tell you who they are, first female cabinet member. I'm ready, said the little girl, let's go. It's not time, Frances, the mother said. My name is not Frances, said the little girl. I am Sandra. I'll be the judge of when it's time. Well, Sandra, today's your day. Get your warm coat. It's cold in Washington, D.C. in January. And so this is Sandra Day O'Connor, who was the first female justice of the Supreme Court.
Is it time? asked the little girl. It's time, the mother said. <laughs> Let's hurry, the little girl said. Capital idea, said the father. And there's the U.S. Capitol. And there they are at the inauguration for a female president, which has yet to happen, right? <laughs> The end. And in the back of this book, it's so cool because it gives you all the little um, biographies and facts about all the women in this book. So I think it's fun. It's a fun book. Isabella Girl in Charge. Yay. Okay. Um, I do have some jokes. And like I said, I also have some facts for you. Um. I do have a presidential joke that I found. All right, here we go. This is from How to Be the Funniest Kid in the Whole Wide World. Uh, what's the main difference between a duck and George Washington? What's the main difference between a duck and George Washington? Hello, hello. Oh, I'm glad you like it, Sarah. You should come and get that book from Melody. I think she would really like it. Uh, okay, the difference between a duck and George Washington. <laughs> um, one has a bill on his face. The other has his face on a bill. Got it? <laughs> one has a bill on his face. The other has his face on a bill. All right. Um, <clears throat> also, I said that I do have some like fun facts about President's Day and presidents in general. So one of the um, one of the interesting facts that I have is uh, who was the first president to live in the White House? Who was the first president? Who do you think the first president was to live in the White House? And it's not who you think. It's not who you think. Um, I'll give you a couple minutes. Who do you think was the first president? <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Mind blown. I know, right? Waka waka! <laughs> oh, hi, Kelly! Kelly's here! There's your story time chime! Thank you for, um, thank you for coming. That's right! It was John Adams! He was the, um, second president of the United States. Um, and he didn't move into the White House until, um, November 1st, 1800, and it was still not finished. The White House still wasn't finished when John Adams moved in. So that uh, was kind of a cool piece of trivia, I thought. <laughs> All right, so from John Adams to another president, we are going to read about Thomas Jefferson, and this is Thomas Jefferson's feast. And this is kind of a fun story about all kinds of different foods that Thomas Jefferson introduced. So, here we go. Ready? There he is. Long ago, before your great-great-grandparents were born, there lived a man named Thomas Jefferson. You probably know his name because he was the third president of the United States. But that's not all there is to know about Thomas Jefferson. He had red hair. Thomas Jefferson loved to read. He collected books about the stars and books about history. In fact, he had one of the largest libraries in America at the time, probably. Thomas Jefferson also loved to write. He wrote letters to people like Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. In his lifetime, he wrote over 20,000 letters. That's like writing a letter a day, every day for 55 years. Wow, that's a lot of letter writing. But if you think about it, they probably, you know, had time to write letters and they weren't occupied, preoccupied with social media and things like that. <laughs> Many of Thomas's letters said that America should be its own country. The British thought America belonged to them. 
So Thomas Jefferson went to work writing the Declaration of Independence. He wrote and rewrote it for 17 days straight until he got it just right. And there he is with his quill pen. And of course, with all that reading and writing and thinking, sometimes Thomas Jefferson got tired and sometimes his back hurt and sometimes he got hungry. And when that happened, he usually took a break and had a snack because Thomas Jefferson really, really loved food. I get it. I get it, right? <laughs> uh, let me go down here. Your mom probably does rival that number for writing that many letters. She loves to write letters. I hope she's not watching. <laughs> if you are, hi. <laughs> Thomas liked food so much, he sometimes spent as much as $50 on groceries in just one day. That would be like spending $750 today. $750 on groceries in one day. But look at all that food. Thomas also spent a lot of time thinking about food. He even thought about better ways to get food. Sometimes Ch Thomas Jefferson got hungry late at night after everyone else had gone to bed. And when that happened, he had to tiptoe down the hallway and all the way downstairs to the kitchen. Then he had to fix a tray of food and carry it all the way back upstairs and down the long, dark hallway to the dining room. If he was lucky, there was still a little left when he sat down to eat. <laughs> Maybe he wasn't so coordinated, right? Maybe that means all the food kept falling off the tray. That's what it looks like. The bread and the milk. <laughs> Thomas needed an easier way to get his food upstairs. So he built a little elevator in his house. It was too small to carry people, but it could take food and drinks from the kitchen to the dining room upstairs without spilling a drop. Thomas called his invention a dumb waiter. Thomas's dumb waiter is still in his house in Virginia today and it still works. Wow, so he invented the dumb waiter. Pretty cool. Thomas had a giant garden behind his house. The garden was a thousand feet long and it was filled with more than 200 different kinds of fruits and vegetables. Look at the grapes. I think that's probably corn right there. Carrots. Those look like carrots. If you visit Thomas's house, Monticello, today, you can still see many of the fruit trees that he planted. That's not too far from here, actually. I don't think. Sometimes Thomas wanted a snack from his garden, but the apples on the bottoms of the trees were usually already picked. Hmm, thought Thomas, there must be a simple way to get apples from the top of the tree, from way up here. Thomas found a long wooden pole. He attached a metal basket to it, and the basket had hooks at the top. He used the hooks to pull off the apples. Presto! Ripe apples fell right into the basket. That's pretty cool. In 1784, Thomas sailed to France. He wanted to help make America's friendship with France stronger. So Thomas was sad to leave America and Monticello, but he knew it was an important job. He also knew there would be lots of new foods to try. I think that's one of the best parts of traveling is trying new foods, right? Thomas was right. In between meetings, he tasted macaroni covered with cheese. Macaroni and cheese in France. He munched on potatoes fried in the French manner, <laughs> otherwise known as French fries. One of my favorite things in the whole world. One night he went to a dinner party. Hello, said Thomas. Bonjour, said his host. 
Bonjour means hello in French. Thomas' host offered him a special dessert. It was ice cream wrapped in a warm pie crust. Ice cream hadn't come to America yet. Thomas took a bite. Good, said Thomas. Bon, said his host. Bon means good in French. So it tells you down here how to pronounce it. It says for bonjour, say bonjour. And for bon, say bon. <laughs> During his visit, Thomas saw a Frenchman eating a bright red fruit. It was called a pomme d'amour. That means a love apple in French. Thomas had seen the fruit before, but in America it was usually just used for decoration. Most people thought it was poison, so no one ate it in America. The Frenchman promised it was not poison, so Thomas took a bite. Thomas loved the apple, and it's pronounced pomme de pomme de pomme de mort. There we go, pomme de mort. <laughs> My French is not is not good obviously. Thomas stayed in France for five years. When it was time for him to go back to America, he couldn't wait to share all of his favorite new foods. He wrote down the recipes for macaroni and cheese, fried potatoes, and ice cream. He even decided to plant some love apples at Monticello. He waved goodbye to his French friends and he got on a ship Au revoir means goodbye in French. Au revoir. How was France, everyone asked, when Thomas got home. Delicious, answered Thomas. He decided to have a feast to show off the new foods. And this sign here says, welcome home, Tom. So he's going to have a big party and invite everybody over to have all of these new foods that he found in France. Of course, that was easier said than done. Thomas planted love apple seeds and waited for them to grow. He drew a picture of a macaroni making machine he had seen in France, and then he sent a friend all the way to Italy to buy one. Thomas had heard that Italy had the best macaroni making machines. He dug up potatoes from his garden. Look, I would love to try to go grow potatoes. Finally, he made ice cream. This was not easy. First, he mixed cream and eggs and sugar, and he packed it with ice and salt. Then he stirred and stirred and stirred. You got to stir a lot to make the ice cream. At last, everything was ready. The love apples were ripe, the macaroni was cheesy, the potatoes were crisp, the ice cream was icy. Perfect, said Thomas. Thomas invited all of his friends. What is for dinner, they asked. It's a surprise, said Thomas. Let's eat. Look at all those friends, look at. She's wondering what's under, she's taking a peek. Thomas's guests loved the feast. They gobbled up the macaroni and cheese. They ate every last fried potato. They asked for more of Thomas's ice cream. They even asked for recipes. And when they were about to go home, Thomas noticed something. No one had touched their love apples. Everyone believed they were poison. Try them, Thomas begged. No thanks, everyone said, we're full. Thomas felt terrible. How could he get people to try love apples? So, let's see. Did I skip it? No, I didn't. The next day, Thomas rode into the town of Lynchburg to visit a friend. He noticed a few love apples growing in her yard. Suddenly, Thomas had an idea. He asked if he could pick a few love apples, and his friend said yes. Thomas walked down the street with the love apples. Just 
carrying the love apples in his arms. He raised one to his mouth and people stopped and pointed. What are you doing? They shouted. They're poison. Stop. And Thomas took a bite. Oh no, everyone said, save him. He's going to get sick. <laughs> They're shocked. Look, look at this lady's face. <laughs> but Thomas didn't get sick. He just kept eating. Pretty soon people got curious about the love apples and they tried them themselves. Scrumptious, everyone said. And to this day, Americans enjoy eating love apples, especially on pizza. Do we know what love apples are yet? What are they? Today, we still eat many of the foods Thomas Jefferson bought, brought from France. Only now we call potatoes fried in the French manner, French fries. And we call love apples tomatoes. Macaroni and cheese is still called macaroni and cheese. And ice cream is still called ice cream. <laughs> The end. This is his macaroni making machine that he drew a picture of. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Did you know that they actually serve, this is Thomas Jefferson's feast, they actually serve Thomas Jefferson's original ice cream recipe at Mount Rushmore. Uh, we visited there a few years ago and they in their little ice cream shop there they have his original ice cream recipe and that's what they serve so that's pretty cool um okay i'm going to give you another fun fact about president's day so here we go um okay this is this is a pretty interesting um fact too that i didn't know um, who was the first president born a U.S. citizen? So, like, born in the United States. Who was the first president to be born in the United States? And he's not very, uh, not a very well-known, I mean, president. I don't know. Anyone know? Anyone know first president born? Good morning, Linda! Thank you for coming to story time. I'm reading my story time chime for you, ringing my story time chime for you. Thank you for showing up. Um, okay, so the first president that was born a U.S. citizen was the actually eighth president of the United States, and that was Martin Van Buren. Martin Van, eighth president. That took a long time. <laughs> That was a very interesting piece of trivia. Okay, I have one more story for you. We're going to do quickly, quickly, uh, because we are over our time, but I started a little late, so. The last story that we have is called Woodrow the White House Mouse. Woodrow the White House Mouse. And this is a cute little rhyming story. So. Here we go. Look at all the mice. Every four years, like the rest of us do, the mice of the nation elect someone too. Living in Washington's grandest old house, a leader respected, a president mouse. Woodrow G. Washington won the last vote. A mouse Yankee doodle, the newspapers wrote. So good and so brave and smart, if you please. His favorite food? Why, American cheese. <laughs> Uh, that looks to be him right there. Woodrow G. Washington. So, on a cold winter's day, with most solemn respect, two presidents swore to preserve and protect our nation, our freedoms, our flag, see it wave, our land of the free, and our home of the brave. And there he is, right there. The White House was lit floor to roof, wall to wall for the beautiful, splendid inaugural ball. Soon Woodrow arrived with his first lady Bess and their children in tow, about eight, more or less. 
Let's see, where... It doesn't show them in this picture. Interesting. <laughs> they were Truman and Franklin, the two oldest sons, and Quentin and Kermit, the mischievous ones, and Dolly and Millie, and the twins George and Art. Not even their classmates could tell them apart. There's the twins right there, huh? And what does he say? Say cheese, of course. The stateroom was filled with good will and good cheer. The mouse children watched from the great chandelier. It was going quite well until George, with a whoop, slipped and landed. Kersplash. Kersplash. In a senator's soup. Oh, no. Uh-oh. The president has a big job, you'll agree, but many places to go, many people to see. In the great Oval Office, he does all of his thinking, and Woodrow, they say, is as smart as Abe Lincoln. <laughs> <clears throat> the president mouse has a desk on the shelf, where he works with with his helpers, or just by himself. Our grand constitution keeps a president busy. So many assignments, a mouse could get dizzy. I feel like that's how we all feel about work, right? <laughs> so much to do. The primary job of the President Mouse is working with Congress, the Senate, and House on making new laws for the good of the nation, health, peace, and justice for the whole population. The president is required to study each bill that Congress delivers from Capitol Hill. If he signs it, a bill becomes law. It's approved. If he gives it a veto, it's rejected, removed. He's the chief executive, which means he's in charge of government departments, the small and the large. Government departments include transportation, justice and labor, and of course, education. So there's a whole little chart there the chief executive, and then you have all these different departments, labor, transportation, treasury, interior, energy. <clears throat> he is also commander in chief, and that means the Army and Navy, Air Force and Marines report to the president as boss, the big cheese. On this, every soldier and sailor agrees. <laughs> The president regularly talks with and greets the leaders from foreign countries he meets. In this job, the president is our head of state when handling foreign affairs, small and great. But the president also gets time out to play. Every Easter, for instance, is egg rolling day. They are there are orange eggs, yellow eggs, purple eggs too. There are even some eggs colored red, white, and blue. That would be fun to go to the White House Easter egg roll. Inside the White House, there's also more fun for Wor for Woodrow, his family, and most everyone. The East Room is used for artistic events like concerts and shows for mouse ladies and gents. One night, Millie dreamed that on one special day she might, if she practiced, danced, dance an East Room Ballet. She'd be joined by the famous Marine Mouse Quartet for her flawless finale, a fine pirouette. <laughs> the Red Room and Green Room are not side by side, but they're wonderful places for children to hide. When they play hide and seek and Woodrow is seeking, but he finds them so fast. Could it be that he's peeking? Hmm. Maybe. The blue room at Christmas is decked to the ceiling. The fire is roaring, the children all squealing. Excited that Christmas is once again here to share with our loved ones and those we hold dear. Wow, that's a big tall tree, isn't it? They needed a ladder to get to the top. And as he nodded to sleep, the good President Mouse was 
thankful for family and country and house. It's also wonderful was his happy reflection that a fellow just might want to seek re-election. <laughs> the end. And it has a nice um, historical note um, here for parents and teachers to use this book, like in the classroom or at home. Yeah. And there, look, they even have a section, fun facts about presidents. So let's see. It says the smallest president was James Madison, who was five feet, four inches tall and weighed less than a hundred pounds. Um, and the tallest was Abraham Lincoln, who stood six feet, four inches tall. Um, the president with the most children was John Tyler, who had 15 children. Uh, let's see. What else? The, oh, this was another fact that I had on my other sheet. The president who served the shortest term was William Henry Harrison, who actually died of pneumonia one month after he was inaugurated. One month. He was only president for a month. Um, okay, so that was Woodrow the White House Mouse. <laughs> Oh, when your oldest son was little, he went to the White House egg roll. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that would be fun. All right, friends. Well, uh, I think that's it for today. I wanted to thank you for joining me for the story time. It was a lot of fun. Um, lots of interesting things to learn uh, today about presidents and American history in general. So maybe sit down with a president book or come to the library and check some out. We have a great selection. Um, <clears throat> don't forget Wednesday um, evening at 7 p.m. we have our regular bedtime story time on Facebook as well. Uh, parents and grown-ups, we also have our um, limited edition uh, Charlestown Library library bags that are $12. You can come by the library and pick one up and you get to fill the bag with books from our sale table out in our lobby for free. So you get an entire bag of books for $12 uh, for the books and the bag, which is a pretty good deal. Um, I'm trying to think. We are obviously open today, so come by and um, see us until 5. And I think that's it. So let's go ahead and sing our closing song. You guys always like this one. We've got lots of arm movements here, so let's let's get started. All right, friends, it's been such a wonderful story time. I really enjoyed this one. Okay, if you know the words, sing along with me. Here we go, ready? See you later, alligator. After a while, crocodile. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> See you soon, big baboon. In the morn, unicorn. Gotta go, buffalo. Blow a kiss, jellyfish. Wave bye-bye, butterfly. Out the door, dinosaur. Rawr! <laughs> All right, friends, have a wonderful week. Thank you again for joining me today. Uh, let me take one last look at the comments. Thank you, Linda. Oh, Mr. Lincoln had a goat in the White House. Wow. Um, thank you for joining today. I really enjoyed it. I hope you had a good time as well, and I will see you next week. Bye, friends. Be kind to one another. See you later.